crikey. <laughs> Um, well, apart from writing this, I mean, I've been doing another little, I've done another little booklet, which is actually about that. Yeah. So perhaps you should stock it and sell it. Well, I'm sure we will. <laughs> but in there, I say things like, even if it's, even if the project's generated by the community, somebody has to be in charge. Somebody has to make sure it's all done. And you need what I described as a charismatic character to run it. But trees are added awkward because <laughs> she was thinking of me, you see. Um, and really, it's it's a case of just grafting on people who've got some knowledge or some experience or some interest. What you shouldn't do is say to the village, "We're going to do this project. Who wants to get involved?" Mm -hmm. Because you'll never cope with the five hundred people that'll volunteer. Mm. You know, it's it's we built ours up gradually to a dozen. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, that is at Winscombe, not Shapwick. Shapwick, well, Shapwick actually was only about 15 most of the time. Um, and then there are certain things you need to do. I mean, if, if he says before um, Victorian era, then you need to see what maps are available. Right. And what medieval documents are available. And you need to look at the buildings. People always forget about the buildings, mm. but the buildings are sort of layer one of the archaeology, you know, they're the mm. upstanding bit. Mm. Yes. Um, and here we had all the buildings looked at that were on the, I think it was the 1880s map, mm. with some amazing, surprising results in them. Uh, the main one, which was the manor house, yeah. which mm. turns out to be a 15th century building. Mm. Um, but I think perhaps the main piece is take a bit of advice. Yes. You know, talk to other people who've done projects like it and the pitfalls and stuff like that. And you think it's important to have um, someone involved with someone in charge, really? Yeah. I mean, it, I, it's not a popular thing to say because mm. these things are all supposed to be spontaneous and democratic, mm. but actually, they are research projects mm. and therefore somebody has to be responsible for writing stuff up and publicising it and steering it, you know. Yeah. Mm. Um, and uh, it's, it's, I mean, somebody's got to talk to the landowners. Mm. You know, somebody's got to apply for money. And yes, because mm. I suppose you're very much reliant on, um, like, like you see, you're saying, the to Farmers totally. Corporation. And yeah. Here, the, at, at Chapwick, the estate belonged to Lord Vesty, and there was a land agent uh, who worked at Sirencester. <clears throat> and uh, looking back on it, that was critical to mm. make contact with him to agree things with him, for him to be comfortable with what we were doing. Um, and there were re there was really only one major mm -hmm. landowner. Mm -hmm. Where I'm working now, there's, there's shed loads of small landowners, and it's a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare <laughs> to find out who owns what and get permission yes. off them. You know? yeah. So, um, I mean, that's the other thing. You know, if, it's a if it's a parish or a village with one landowner, it's going to be a lot easier. You know, if yes. it's got lots and lots and lots of landowners, and you know that most of them are awkward, go and find somewhere else. <laughs> don't even don't even think about it. It's that just sounds, hard work. That sounds like a good tip. <laughs>
and particularly where they've been to the loo, mm. where their animals have been to the loo, it affects the soil. Mm. And it will, it will stay affected for a very long time. So if you take soil samples and look at the complement of elements in the, in the sample you've got, you can tell whether there's been human occupation or not. And I think the, perhaps the greatest contribution in some ways uh, at Chapwick was the heavy metal analysis of soil samples. And um, when people buy the book, <laughs> right, um, there's a site called Sladwick, mm. which was a, a, a case in point where the, 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 the name of the field, Sladwick, suggests a farm site with the wick yeah. name, you see. Mm. And we field walked it, because it was ploughed, and what we got basically was broken field drains and a few bits of Roman pottery. Now, almost any field in England has got a few bits of Roman pottery in it because of manuring and debris and stuff. So we then had it, had some geophysics done on it and that showed some very strange anomalies. Uh, and then we have, uh, we had the heavy metal um, samples done mm. and there was this blob in the middle of the field of a high concentration of lead. And so we dug a hole in it and there was a little Roman building mm. with shed loads of pottery and, and coins and burials, children's burials, all sorts of things. Wow. And we wouldn't have spotted it mm. from just walking the field. Yes. So it proved <laughs> actually that, you know, the concentrations of different elements mm. was, was a good indicator. Oh, fantastic. You know, I think that it, it, there's not much of it been done since because it's very expensive. Mm. Very, you know, you've got to have a lab basically. But I'd have thought that in future it's something that people ought to develop a lot more. Um, so yeah, that's just one, one example. Yeah. Well, it come along rather late, actually. Um, well, I mean, religion, I mean, every group probably ever seems to have had some sort of belief system, and, mm. you know, usually belief in some sort of deity and life after death and all that sort of stuff. But in, certainly in, in, in Chapwick, the, there was a church from probably about 700. Um, but it was outside where the later village was. Right. And then in the 14th century, they, they moved or they, they built a church to replace the one outside the village in the middle of the village. Mm. So in that sense, it was very much a latecomer. That's not normally true, I don't think. I think often the church is one of the earliest features mm. in the village. But I, I, don't, I don't think I really buy into the idea of it having an influence on where the village is or the shape of the village or anything like that. Churches tend to start out as appendages to the manor houses mm. of, the, of the, the guy who owns, and it's always a guy, who owns the village mm. and owns the parish. And he provides a church eventually for his family. And that eventually becomes the parish church. So that's the link, I think. It doesn't right. matter if there's a village or not. You yeah. know. Uh, yes, to the last bit, <laughs> um, which is why I asked Victor Ambrose mm. to do me a, a, a coloured painting of people dismantling their farms mm. and carting the building materials to the new village to right. put up their farm there. And I thought that would really sort of, mm. you know, encapsulate what had gone on. And I, and I, I would. There's a lot of debate about it, but I think it's coercion. Mm. But then I'm a terrible Marxist, you know. I just I see the, the people doing the farm work as one group, and the, the idle lords as something else. You know? mm. So I and my experience in life is basically the powerful and the wealthy do tell other people what to do. Mm. You know, that's not that's not a you know that's not a, an odd thing to say. It's how the world works. Yeah. Um, but the answer to the answer to his question actually is that I think somewhere in the process is the 
the sort of vast amount of cereals that were produced. Uh, and, and I think that's what it's about. And it's interesting the contrast with what I'm working on now, this parish at Winscombe in mm. North Somerset, yeah. with Shapwick. Yeah. Because you could see Shapwick as a, a big cereals producing factory. Right. You know, the, the land is organised to grow as much cereals as possible. The labour force is organised to grow, to work the land, to grow mm. as much cereal as possible. Whereas where I live, which is dispersed settlement in Winscombe, it's all about cattle production, sheep production, horse grow, horse rearing, you know, and the, an arable doesn't doesn't figure very much. The thing about arable is that before modern machinery, it is incredibly labour intensive. Mm. You know, you've got those eight oxen and a plough and two ploughmen, and you're trying to plough an acre a day, mm. and there's hundreds of acres to plough. And then somebody's got to scatter the seed, and then somebody's got to keep the weeds off, and somebody's keep, got to keep the crows off. And then when it's ripe, you know, an army has to harvest it. Mm. And we know that, don't we? Because the whole of the academic year is still structured to release people in July and August mm. to get the harvest in. Yeah. You know? Yeah. School kids still break up in July. Mm. You know, universities still stop. And the reason was every hand was necessary to get mm. the crop in. So, and I think so. I think village is really a, it's a concentration of labour, and it's interesting that what comes in with it is a lot of regulation. Mm. You know, the manorial court roles and records, and the the the, um, the customs of the duties of different people, how many days labour they owe, and all this sort of stuff all comes in with that. Right. So I think villages are about cereal production, and yes, I think it's about coercion. Well, I mean, without knowing the details of where he is, that's sort of what I, I think, right. and a number of other people do. That, that, and again, it's this contrast between common fields and villages, like Shapwick, mm. with a lack of woodland or mm. lack of much woodland, and places that have are scattered farms and hamlets, often with lots of commons, as he says, mm. which is what my, which Winscombe's mm. got. And, you know, if you play around with the doomsday figures, for example, you can often show that the area was formerly more wooded. Mm. Uh, or there might be, I mean, I don't think it applies where he lives, but there might be royal forest records and things that mm. show that. And, um, I mean, I think what, what tends to happen is that a lot of the um, nucleated villages with common fields are in areas which have been farmed for a very long time. Mm. When you look at the Shapwick material it's quite mm. clear that that landscape has been farmed, probably for arable, for about 6,000 years, 5,000 years. Whereas other areas, like the sort of area he's talking about, you get the impression that it was people have been chopping bits of wood out and growing crops and then it's been grown over with wood again and mm. then they've chopped a bit more out of somewhere else. Mm. And the fact is they've got a reserve of timber trees that they're using for you know, timber frame buildings, mm. like the one he lives in. And uh, I mean, that's exactly the trick, get it dendro-dated. Mm. You know, that's the date of the felling of those trees. And I'm sure if he did the whole village, they may have done the whole village, but um, you'd probably find a lot of it was 15th, 16th century. Right. And uh, by which time they're starting to actually conserve the trees. Mm. And, because there's so, been so much erosion of it. But um, tell, him, tell him to start a, a whole parish survey. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> there's not enough of these dispersed villages and scattered hamlet parishes being done, you see. Right, okay, well that's interesting. Uh, more people need to, to tackle them. They're hard work, that's mm. the trouble. They're yeah. really hard work. One's tempted to say always the last one. You know? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> you get to a point with them where 
you're absolutely fed up with them. <laughs> and uh, when you think that we, we worked in the field at Shapwick for 10 years, mm. and then it's effectively taken another 10 years to, you know, first of all get the big fat volume out yeah. and get this one out. Yeah. You never want to see it again, really. <laughs> and um, the trouble is, I think they're a bit like girlfriends. Projects are, you know, you sort of you're dead keen to start with, and you put a lot of effort in, and then the magic wears off, and you start to look around for the next one, <laughs> and you you have to make sure you finish the last one before you. So, I mean, I'm quite excited about the one I'm doing at the moment, mm. and <clears throat> and we're likely to do just a very small study of another place right. um, which we've just begun to look at um, so yeah always the last one really right. <laughs>
and those are the things that are being butchered mm. left, right and centre and archaeology is one of the things that's going to get butchered mm. so you know it's all in a terrible state really we're not we're not strong enough or influential enough with politicians unlike say the bird people mm. or the twittery fluttery brigade as I call them um, you know it, it, archaeology in terms of jobs when someone could disappear tomorrow mm. um, so uh, I mean the answer to that question is everything needs doing yeah. I think everything is in a parlous state and almost any period or topic needs research it's a bit all embracing isn't it <laughs> <laughs>
Mm. In Shapwick, drawing mm. attention to the book yeah. again, yeah. Right? Well, in Shapwick there is something like, oh I don't know, let's say eight or nine hordes of Roman coins have been found, including the the last one, which was the one that they, they got 300,000 quid for this hoard of coins. Right now, that is now in Taunton Museum, yeah. because Taunton Museum had to raise the money to buy it. But of the previous hoards that were found right back to the 18th century, the only ones that exist now are the ones in Taunton Museum. In other words, if you go to the museum, they remain looked after and intact. Mm -hmm. If they stay out with the finders, they get dispersed. So, you know, there's a lesson. Mm -hmm. If the stuff mm -hmm. isn't in a museum, under lock and key, with the records and boxed up, the chances are it will disappear. Oh, thank God it's only one day visit. <laughs> no antibiotics, you <laughs> say. Um, well, perhaps I can give two answers yeah, to that. Sure. One is that, which is to do with the theme of the Shapwick uh, project and book, which, which would be to see that day, and it, in many cases it must have been a day, when they said, OK, we're taking this farm down now, mm -hmm. where you've lived out in the sticks, out in the fields for generations, and we're going to move you into the, this new village we've laid out. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that must have been as much of an upheaval as the enclosure of the fields with hedges mm. was in the 18th century or 17th century or whatever, you know, the, if it, there was this open countryside and suddenly it had all these mm. new fences and mm. new hedges put in, dramatically cha changed it. So I think that would be a very interesting, so you could talk to them and say, well, why, why has this happened? Why are you doing this? Mm. What have they told you? Mm. You know, is there a good reason for it? But I think the other one, which is surprising coming from me perhaps, because I tend to spend my time in the post-Roman period, mm. is to go right back to when uh, agriculture comes in. So you have, I mean, we, we arbitrarily divided up the Mesolithic, the Middle Stone Age, when people are hunter-gatherers, mm. really quite sophisticated hunter-gatherers. And then by the Neolithic, um, they're beginning to farm and domesticate animals and so on and uh, a lot of the um, anthropological evidence suggests that this is a much more labour intensive uh, activity. Mm. Um, Marshall Sarlins who wrote a, a splendid book called Stone Age Economics which is a really good read interviewed a lot of um, horticulturalists and farmers around the you know, so-called primitive groups around the world uh, and then then talk to hunter-gatherers who live nearby and say well why aren't you doing what they're doing you know mm. and uh, there were, I remember there was one group in New Guinea or somewhere and there were, there were a group that were basically hunters and there was a group that had gardens and pigs and when he said um, well, why don't you do what they do? That is to the hunter gatherers. Why don't you do what the the people with the garden? The people. It's just too much of hard work. <laughs> <laughs> All that, you know. and, and if you if you look at the um, the sort of Mesolithic economy, I think the first the, the main activity of the day is sleeping under the tree, and then the next main activity is visiting relatives over the hill, and then some way down the list comes going and getting dinner, you know. <laughs> so it, it makes you wonder why people mm. went in for that. And, mm. and I mean, there's a huge amount of stuff written about it and books about it and mm. so on. But I think it'd be very interesting at the point they said, well, OK, you know, we're convinced we'll try growing some grain and we'll try domesticating these sheep or whatever, yeah. you know. Why, why would you do that yeah. rather than go and hunt something? Yeah. You know? So um, those two, but only for one day. I'm glad that yeah. lady said only one day, <laughs> because you know there's no doubt about it. The best time to live is now. Yeah. You know, yeah. as soon as you get the flu or something, you realise mm. it's yeah. better to live now. You yeah. know. Because it's the the best study 
of a parish and a village that's been done in this country so far. And, and you know, that sounds terribly conceited, but if you look at the, I mean, the, the, the one that came out very recently was Michael Wood's book. Um, and Michael Woods is a good bloke, he does good television programs, he writes well, and it's an interesting book. But this is much more complete in terms of how you look at a settlement and what you can get out of it. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> and it's a snip of the prize. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mick. Okay. That's a very long answer. No, without any swearing in it at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to be commented.